Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 203, where we interview Rob and Sam Fatzinger, a couple who probably have more kids than you do. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen, and with me, as always, is my agreeable co host, Scott Trench. Agreeable, huh? I concur, Mindy. It's a great <laughs> adjective. Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else, to introduce you to every money story because we truly believe financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter when or where or how many kids you have when you're starting. That's right. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world, go on to make big time investments in assets like real estate, start your own business, or achieve FI with a family of 16, we'll help you reach your financial goals and get money out of the way so you can launch yourself towards your dreams. Scott, we have interviewed multiple dinks on this show, dual income, no kids. Today's guests are a complete 180 from that. Let's call them simks, single income, many kids. How many? The most that we've ever had on the show. Basically, every excuse that we have ever heard for so why someone can't pursue financial independence is blown out of the water by today's guests. Yeah, I mean, th th this is just an incredible story. It, and it, you know, we, we asked them at the end what their biggest mistake, financial mistake was. And spoiler alert, and this is the famous four question, right? But we, they couldn't think of one. They, 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 were, they were talking about it. And it took them you know, 20 years or something to, to pay off the first mortgage. And then they really achieved five from that position with the paid off house uh, over the last 10 years or so. And the how of it is just you know, really a tremendous amount of discipline uh, a real, a, a clear dedication to their values in what seems like a wonderful life and thriving large family here. And so just really awesome show today. I think you're going to learn a lot and be really inspired. A couple of the spoilers there we just gave away. I don't think they'll change what you'll take away from the show, but should we bring it in? They shouldn't. Rob and Sam, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money podcast. I cannot wait to hear your story, but first let's introduce your family. So we have 14 children. 14. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm Sam and this is Rob. And you have 14 kids. Yes. Okay. Well, you can't reach financial independence with 14 kids. So thank you so much for your time today. And we'll talk to you later. Bye. Oh, nice talking to you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We have to tell you. Okay. So I am all, I am going to knock down every one of the, uh, protests that I hear people say all the time with in one fell swoop with your story. So let's look at your family. How old is your oldest? How young is your youngest? Our oldest is 31 and our youngest is four. And we have eight grandchildren. How old's your oldest grandchild? Six. I love it. So your oldest grandchild <laughs> is older than your youngest child. That's yes. happened in my family too. My yeah, mom's my family. Yes. Yeah. Math is hard sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it is. <laughs> My granddaughter asks her mom, mommy, why does Grammy have kids? <laughs> <laughs> really good question, Scarlett. Okay. So you have lots of kids. Clearly you live in a low cost of living area. Yeah. It's, it costs nothing to live in the DC area. Oh, did I mention we lived in DC suburbs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, 14 kids in a high cost of living area. You must both work full time jobs making $500,000 a year. Each, yeah. <laughs> I'm a stay at home mom living my dream. And I um, work in IT, make uh, a little bit over 100000 a year. Okay, 14 kids, high cost of living area, a hundred ish thousand dollars a year. You must have no savings rate. We save, um, yeah, it's not too high. It's about 50%. Did you just say it's not too high? It's about 50%? Sorry, my okay. sarcasm came out there. It, I it, love yeah. it. I love it. I love it. Okay. Um, if you're listening and you think that I knew the answer to these questions ahead of time, of course I did. Uh, <laughs> Rob and Sam are what we have termed, we have coined the term simks, single income, many kids. and T-shirts t -shirts coming. <laughs> <laughs> they are on the path. Hustle. Are you on the path to financial independence or are you there already? We are what I'd call 99% there. I mean, I could stop working this afternoon. And if my boss sees that, maybe he'll fire me. And, uh, <laughs> no, um, 
<laughs> make room for somebody else. Uh, the, the plan is officially uh, at the end of the year to um, uh, retire. Okay. And with probably do, do some stuff part-time for, you know, side businesses or, you know, something to bring in a little extra money here and there. But And he does turn 56. All right. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. So you are financially independent, living in a high cost of living area with a lot of kids on one income, saving 50% anyway, and you're not 65. I'm not. Do I, do I look it? I'm afraid <laughs> No, to you don't <laughs> okay, look okay. it. But how can you get to retirement with all these things stacked up against you? Let's go. Let's go talk about your story. Where does it start? When we got engaged or she likes to, well, it starts earlier for her. Go ahead. <laughs> so just that my parents, I'm the youngest of nine. And because I was the youngest, my mom and dad actually grew up during the depression. So we just always grew up very minimally. All of our needs were always met. We always had. A- Minimalist before it was cool. Yes. Beautiful dinner on the table every night. You know, all the courses always had shoes, always had clothes, <laughs> but the mindset of need versus want and, you know, make do with what you have and, you know, recycle and all those things that are so in right now. So I just kind of grew up never expecting a lot and never going above and beyond what was necessary. And then when Rob and I, we were dating when I was in high school and then we later got engaged. And I think we were a little shocked that he actually asked me and it was around 1988 and he, I looked shocked and he looked at me. Seemed like a good idea at the time. It'll be 32 <laughs> years uh, in a couple of days where I have our 32 anniversary, 32nd anniversary is coming up yeah. in, in two days. Congratulations. Thank Thanks. you. So what did you say? I said, well, you have to say yes, because who else will give you 10 kids, a white picket fence and a dog? <laughs> And I also might have mentioned something about the being thrown off the mountain we were on a uh, picnic, if she didn't say yes. But. And I pondered for a second and thought, you know what? There aren't a lot of guys right now who would like to have a big family. And so I, she settled for me. And I've always, wanted to be, I've always wanted to have lots of kids. I've always wanted to be a mom since I was like in second grade. And so I said, yes. I said, forget the dog and make it 11 kids. <laughs> and uh and that was the deal a year later we got married and got pregnant on our honeymoon <laughs> and she's got three extra kids on top of the 11 i promised her so. yes we got some bonus <laughs> kids. babies i gave birth to 12 and we adopted a, a we have a nine-year-old now who we adopted when he was five but we got him when he was 12 weeks old we were just going to help out a mom and a a hard time. And so we had him from when he was 12 weeks old. And by the time he was five, we finally persuaded her to let us adopt him. And then we have a bonus baby who we got out of the hospital four and a half years ago, and he will be five in August. And we've had him constantly. And we, again, are hoping that his parents will let us adopt him. So who knows what God has in store, but we because we were financially independent, being able to be open to these other children was able, we were able to do that. And th- the funniest thing too was 15 years ago, our daughter, who was our 10th child, we were making half as much then. So we just kept living simply and never, you know, as my husband was making more money, we just kept living like we had all those years. Yeah, we started out um, when we were engaged and then first married, Sam was working um, part time, but we always lived on my income and we just saved um, whatever she was making at the time. And then when she, the first year of marriage, when she had the baby, then she just you know stopped working. So we just always were used to living on one income. Well, let let's let's dive into it and, and kind of go through the the financial journey here. We um with with all this. So 30, 32 years ago, thirty one mm-hmm. years ago, and three hundred and sixty three days ago yep. Um, yep. Is, is where the journey begins. And 
what's your financial position at that point? What do you, what, what's the, uh, the, the income and savings yeah. and, and wealth of that? Yeah, point? that's, well, let's see, that'd be, uh, yeah, May of 89 ish. Yeah. May, um, I was working at a bank, um, probably making 17, 18,000 a year. <laughs> I think my, my first, now that was a, a raise from my, you know, up from my, when I got out of college, I was making 13,000 a year at a bank. Um, we, um, Sam was working part time, so we saved all that. After about a year, we, we opened a bookstore in 1990, summer of 1990. And we had our own bookstore until, and I quit work at the bank after a year and ran that full time. Um, Sam and the baby, the first baby, we were actually running it during the day most of the time. <laughs> and then um, we had that for 10 years. And then um, this weird little known business called Amazon kind of um, help, <laughs> help, helped, uh, you know, Make, make, make it not be viable as as viable so we were during that whole during the 90s we probably made between 30 and 40 thousand a year um give or take depending on how the year was business and, wise. and how did you manage your your spending during this point what you know how how, is, how are you building wealth and managing your spending is it intentional in the in the these first five ten years it, of marriage it, it was yeah it was intentional um not as much as it has been the last 15 or so um our first house, our mortgage was 10% in 1989, which 10% interest, low, which 10% interest, which is actually low. Cause you know, when I started working at the bank, we were doing 14, 15%, you know, I was happy to get 10%, which I'm, I know 3% people are now, you know, are looking at me like you're crazy, but so I always paid a little bit extra, um, from day one, from my first mortgage to my last mortgage, um, on that little townhouse we bought. Also started setting aside money. Um, her save, or we were saving her part-time paycheck. Um, from a so daycare center. Right? From, from a daycare center she was working at, probably making four dollars an hour. Minimum and, uh, wage back yeah. in the old days. <laughs> yeah. So we always had some savings, um, like a cushion, you know, to fall back on when the, you know, the radiator went in the car or whatever happened. And also we, we had some money saved so we could use it to open up the bookstore. And we started saving a little bit for retirement um, early on in the traditional IRA back then. You know, I didn't have any retirement plan being self-employed. Um, once we closed down the bookstore in 2000, I got what I call a real job with benefits and started contributing to the 401k. Vacation. How would you peg your kind of net worth around that time in 2000? It sounds like that's like a, a little bit of a turning point for you with closing down the bookstore and starting a new career. Yeah, net worth, it wasn't too bad only because we had just sold a house, our house, and made some money on it and bought a foreclosure. We bought a um, a very beat up foreclosure in a nice neighborhood. So we, we, net worth wise, we were probably around um, 75,000, but most of that was home equity, I would say. Probably maybe 25,000 in savings and retirement 20 years ago, and then started contributing the 401k more and then eventually um, added um, health savings account, which I, I love those, um, contribute to those and don't, I don't spend the money. I let that grow. And we were pregnant with number eight at that time. When we moved into this house, we just had number eight. Yeah. No, number seven. Or number seven, pregnant with number eight. Yeah. I forget their names, but number seven and eight, whatever yeah, their names are. <laughs> um, Robert and Dominic. Okay. She knows the names. I know the numbers. Um, it, it sounds like during this 10 year period, there wasn't a lot of intentional wealth building going on. It was paying the mortgage and keeping a savings account, making sure there, there's, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of stress because you had a savings account, but you weren't really investing for no. retirement or building networks. No, we, we did not have much set aside for retirement in those first 10 years at all. Um, mm -hmm. Just a tiny bit. And yeah, you know, we, we had a cushion, you know, like you mentioned in savings and it was mainly focused on, you know, paying the mortgage, the utilities, and uh, feeding the growing family. <laughs> but we weren't deprived. I mean, we went on vacation each year. I mean, we didn't feel... You went well, on you know, vacation like we, when you had eight kids? Like we were poor. Yeah, yeah. God bless the people who we rented from. I don't think we destroyed any houses. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's that's where our, our simple living comes in. So we would go to the beach. But when we go to the beach, we go to the beach. We don't go to the beach to go on rides or to go out for ice cream or to go miniature golfing or to go to the movies. We go to the beach and we just 
pack lunches, bring food and stay on the beach all day. And, you know, that's a kid's dream. Again, you know, those things are fun and those are special treats. And it was, it's nice that, you know, every once in a while when we do go, an uncle will take a couple to, you know, miniature golf and they just think it's the best. They don't expect it. It's a treat. And so that's kind of where we, you know, draw the line between being frugal and like living and special treats and, and having them appreciate things instead of expect things. Me- mechanically, how did you transport the 10 of you to the beach? Well, we used to have a station wagon and then we graduated to suburban and probably for the last, what, 15, 20 years, we've had a f- the big 15 passenger van. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Which now filling up with gas, which is yeah. ridiculous. I mean, it's 12 miles a gallon. That's not bad these Woo! days, right? <laughs> yes, so that's bad. very efficient for 15. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was bad people. last week when the uh, <laughs> pipeline was shut down. And it was hard to find gas, but um, we. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. It, it, we go off season. We were going off. Se- we were going like the first or second week of September to the beach when it's still nice here, but it's after Labor Day. And you could, instead of $3,000 a week, you could get a rent a house for 700 a week and we, so we homeschool so that also yeah. allows for that and that's one of the secrets to homeschooling some people just homeschool so they can go to the beach in september or october <laughs> <laughs> that's, the price. So, that's the secret <laughs> so this is it's 2001 and you guys you just changed careers here how, how how much are you making and how much how does your wealth begin to change trajectory from from that point over the next couple of years with that yeah i started in the um Oh, I still am. I'm in the um, IT uh, software tester, and I started doing that um, about 20 years ago. Um, started out in the low 40s um, as my salary, and then it crept up over the years, you know, 5 10% here and there. And then I would say 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, I, fi- I hit finally hit the 100,000 100, a year mark. Also, wait, wait. when we talk, tell people about buying this foreclosure, Again, my mom had always taught me to buy like the worst house in the nicest neighborhood. And we both live in the town we grew up in. And uh, it's my dream come true, not my husband's dream come true, but it's my dream come true to live here. And these are the houses in the neighborhood we lived in were the ones that, you know, when I was growing up, you always wanted to live in this particular neighborhood. So we got this amazing foreclosure on a court with a huge backyard. So when you have eight kids, it was just an, you know a gold mine. It had a big room addition in the back. But what you have to understand is it was so beaten up. Instead of taking out a loan to fix it up, we just made it livable. So lots of white paint, you know, the basic appliances, the basic, you know, whatever we could buy, even though. A lot of people can take advantage and, 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 you know, build the house of your dreams. We knew that would put us in debt. So we just did the basics, made it livable. And, you know. Yeah, we took out a, well, I mean, we took out a mortgage on the house, obviously, but we'd, we'd made some money in our other house. This, just for numbers sake, um, this house, and we bought it in May of 2000, it cost 150000 we put 50,000 down because we'd gotten money from our previous house had gone up in value and took out a hundred thousand dollar mortgage. Um, I started, that one was only six and a quarter percent. So we, you know, we're down from the 10% loan. Mm -hmm. So that, so I was paying a little bit extra on that each month. And then um, basically a 15 year mortgage that I, we paid off in 12 years and three months. So the the mortgage was gone in 2012, summer, summer, fall of 2012 which was a shock then, to me. I had no idea. And at the same time, we were starting to save a little bit in our 401k and it started in IRA. And then in 2012, it kind of went into um, overdrive because we didn't have the mortgage anymore. And we just got baby number 13. Yeah. And so okay. our savings so, so rate in, jumped up a lot. In 2000, you buy this property you put you, and you have a $100,000 mortgage. Right. You're, you're contributing a little bit for the next 10, 12 years to your 401ks and those kinds of things. But really the primary driver of wealth, it sounds like is the, is the 15 year mortgage being paid off in 12 and a half years. Is that, is that correct? That that would be correct at that time. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's remarkable in and of itself because you're on one income, you now have a bunch of teenagers. I know how much of a vacuum I was um, for food. 
and then yep. that and they always bring people home which we love like we bring them all over the more the merrier yep so so you're you're again so still for this period you're still not really driving towards phi for this 10 12 year period you're you're more Correct. just kind of you you're not doing anything where you're accumulating debt or you're living well within your means, but it's not an intentional wealth building approach is what I'm hearing for this. Well, That's- I was going to point that out, Scott. They're also not aggressively consuming debt and acquiring debt. And I hear people who don't have 14 kids and don't live in a high cost of living area and have two incomes rapidly acquiring debt on a lot of these stories. And that yeah. right there, I think, is your superpower is just we don't want any debt. So we're not going to get debt. I mean, nobody wants debt. Nobody's right. like, right. Woohoo, let right. me take out all this money and loans and you know, have a hard time sleeping at night, but just because they don't want it doesn't mean it doesn't come into their lives. And yeah. throw in some, four weddings and uh, a, a big trip and two big hospital stays for two of our yeah. sons. But to the debt question, um, we haven't had a credit card debt. I had a little bit um, in 1988, I paid off my credit card. And so last time I carried a balance. And uh, I also had a small car loan. Uh, when I got out of college, I bought a car for like $3,000 um, mm. and had a small loan for that. So it's, other than a mortgage, we haven't had any um, debt since um, 88 yeah, we, so, or 89 when we took out the first mortgage on our, for our first house. Yeah. So it, it sounds like the intentional journey to get to FI begins in 2012. At that yes, point, I, that's yes. a big turning point for us. What, what, what would you say your net, what's your situation in 2012 when this hits? I, I want to know everything. How many, how old are the kids? How, what, what, what's kind of like your, your financial situation? What triggers the change in course or acceleration? Yeah. Two, 2012, we had, um, 12 kids and we had just gotten our, uh, foster baby. Um, we have, you know, our, our house is paid off. So we have, you know, we, we have the equity there, but we're not, you know, and I'm not really counting that as, you know. Oldest daughter just got married. Oldest daughter just gotten married. Um, I'm starting to ramp up, you know, instead of putting, I was, I was probably maybe putting, I probably had like 50,000 in my 401k and IRAs combined. Putting Nine maybe years 10%. ago, you had $50,000 in your 401k and now you are 99% yeah. of the way there. Yes. God bless the bull market. Um, <laughs> so, well, we we probably went from about 10% savings to, you know, to close to, you know, 50% um, savings rate and my, and, and my income was going up at the same time too. And we're just, you know. And our three college sons moved out. Well, that's saved on food. Yeah. <laughs> um, three college age boys moved out. Yeah. that helps. So What's the mechanics um, of that though? Is it, is it the mortgage payment going away at the same time as the income increasing? Are you just getting more intentional with the budget? How, how do you mechanically yeah. increase the savings rate there? It, it, it's yeah it's kind of all of that um i i was like i didn't want to okay we made our last mortgage pay and i'm like well we got this money freed up i don't want to just have it evaporate and go to you know who knows where just to stuff so i i, I was intentionally you know so instead of i was paying extra so we we're paying about two thousand a month on our mortgage even though it wasn't that much but and then i still have about 600 a month you know i have to set aside for property taxes and um homeowners so I just said, well, okay, well, I don't want to just blow this 1400 extra, you know, that is suddenly, you know, in my checking account. And I didn't know he was paying off the house that soon. So it was really no big change for me because I didn't realize he'd been doing this. When he handed me this piece of paper in the front yard, I was like, what's this? And he's like, read it, read it. And I, I'm like, I have no idea what this means. He's like, I paid off the house. And I was like, what? I mean, I, you know, grew up <laughs> in a time where, you know, you would kill the fat of calf and have all the neighbors come over when you, you know, paid off your house. And I, I grew up with right next to the telephone, my parents having a sign, like, God bless our mortgage home, you know, and we just, the, the whole concept was so shocking to me. And I was just in awe. So to me, you know, the day before and the day after was no different because he had been doing this without us ever realizing it. We never, we never felt like we were missing out on anything. So the goal was to just keep on trucking along and keep living simply and not, you know, and buy paper towels every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. So we started cramming all that money into, you know, open up a Roth for both of us. Um, then each year I would um, increase our rate. Like if I got if I got a bonus, if I got a two or 3% raise, I would, you know, increase, you know, it, it all went, 
to um, savings. So, you know, we're maxing out his and her IRAs and which, well, I'm 56 now. So, you know, once I hit 50 and then she's 53. So when she hit 50, you could, you know, contribute even more. Then I hit, you know, 50 with the 401k and you have the, con you know, the catch up contribution. And then probably three or four years ago, our medical plan, you know, it switched to a, um, it was a high, high deductible plan. So I had the HSA. So I think that's 8,000 a year. Now I can contribute to that. And we pay any medical expenses out of pocket instead of touching that. So we're, so we're currently maxing out. I max out my 401k. I, I max out both our IRAs and then I, and I max out the HSA. And I have no idea anything he just said. I can tell you what a good price. I can tell you what a good yeah. price on toilet paper or chicken or ground beef, but I have no no idea. Actually, reading our book, we got to the part where he talks about this. I just skipped that whole chapter. I'm like, I don't even understand any of this. Thanks. Uh, I mean, I mean, it was so enlightening and informing. It was well written. I'm sure. Well, there's there's two sides to it. There's offense and defense, and it's it it, it sounds like Sam, you you've been playing really good defense for. 30 years here with the money and making every dollar stretch and being frugal with, with those types of things. And it, it, that's what I'm picking up. Is that, is that at all correct? Yes. And the funny thing was, you know, I was in shock when he told me he's paying off this house and I was like, Oh my gosh. And then all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, all these years I've been using cloth diapers and spending a half an hour in front of the meat department, trying to figure out if we can afford this meat this week. <laughs> But no, I, I'll help it. It's, yeah, teamwork. Teamwork, but I would don't regret a minute of it. And our kids will tell you, and that that's one of the people's favorite part about this book is our kids talking about this. And actually, our kids are the ones who should be being interviewed because they are amazing and they grew up with this mindset that they had to do it if they wanted it. They had to work their tails off, and they did, and they have, and hopefully the last seven will too. <laughs> well, you're halfway there. Um, <laughs> yeah, seven of them are out of college. Um, eight of them are out of the house. So that's good. It helps the food bill. Yeah. And the water yeah. bill. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about food bills because I know what my, I actually don't know what my food bill is. I haven't tracked my food spending in a while, but I know that when I go to the grocery store, it's a lot all the time. So you yeah, our, our yeah, we used to spend about 1500 a month on groceries. Um, it's down closer to about a thousand now. Um, yeah, a thousand and, for eight kids, six or eight uh, people, eight, six eight kids, people. Eight, eight people, a thousand dollars a month. Yes. How do you do? Do you like grow all of your own vegetables? <laughs> no, no. Our, our, thumb, our thumbs aren't green. We can't even <laughs> grow aloe. I'm the only person in the world who kills my aloe plant. Yeah, <laughs> Actually, right now it's alive, but just give me a couple months. We can grow dandelions. That's about it, but we haven't tried to eat them. We just grow babies. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do. <laughs> uh, they... You know, our kids just, it, it's just amazing. Like, I just, I can't say enough about our kids. And the, we're normal. Like, someone interviewed us and said, what, do your kids just, like, eat lentils all the time? No. <laughs> we eat all the junk and we, you know, we don't grow our own food. We just have taught them to, like, when, when they're out, like, it's so funny. My daughter, <laughs> who's about to be 18, she went out to eat with a bunch of her buddies. And she's like, mom, you know, Gabby got water. It was $2 for a water bottle. I just went up to the counter and said, can I have some tap water with ice in a cup? And she was like, what? You can actually do that? Like she just thought she knew the best kept secret in town. So it's little things like that. And she, my kids work concessions. They see people waste food so much. They, you know, whenever they're out with friends, people will be like, oh, does anybody want this? I'm going to throw it away. And of course I want that. Like you just paid $5.99 for those fries. <laughs> of course I want them. So it's just kind of like, not that they don't get things. It's that they don't, they appreciate them or they work hard for them, but they don't expect them. Yeah. Setting up expectations. What does a week of, of, of food or groceries look like in your household? Size wise? couple carts yeah. um, we, or, have, you mean? we were very blessed we have uh aldi and lidl right close by and then we have a bigger grocery store that marks down their meat at a certain time during the day so i think i mentioned this before my mom always said become friends with the butcher and so i always check with the butchers in the grocery stores near us what time do you put the meat down i have many very often gone to this bigger grocery store and they'll have meat that's going to expire the next day. So 
it's not even expired yet. It's going to expire the next day. And so it's 50% off. So sometimes I hit, you know, a, a bonus and I get like a cart full of ground beef or sausage and chicken breast and chicken, breast and chicken thighs. Or, we, and we have a large freezer and we have two refrigerators. Definitely large freezer. And we <laughs> do have two very big refrigerators in our kitchen. So we have in our kitchen, we have uh, two refrigerators, two dishwashers, two ovens. And so, so what I'll do is I'll get all this meat. It's so funny. I'll go push the cart and everyone's like, oh, you having a cookout today? And then one of the people who works at the store is like, oh no, those are the fat singers. They have 14 kids. They, they buy it and they freeze it. And, you know, and we, it's just an easy way to get meals ready so that whenever we're meal planning, people don't, we don't plan our meals by making a menu and then shop, we plan our meals by opening our freezer and saying, okay, we've got ground beef, we've got sausage, we've got pork, we've got chicken, we've got lots of chicken, we've got a, you know frozen pizza. And so then I make a meal from what we've gotten on sale. And if there's some super sale on you know tomato sauce or you know pasta, because we have a huge pantry, I'll buy 10 of them or I'll buy, you know, whatever the max is. So we'll, we'll, we eat from the pantry, which is really a big thing now. It's called pantry shopping and pantry cooking. And that's how we could really save. And, and again, buying in bulk, I'm not running out to go down the street to go pick up a box of pasta. And then, oh, I am there, I'll grab some of this and grab some of that. We also have a really amazing community. So almost, at least twice a week, someone in our neighborhood's like, who's got cream and mushroom soup? Or who's got frozen broccoli? Or who's got a, a, a bag of flour? So we all kind of team up together. And also those wonderful friends are the same ones who say, hey, I'm going to Aldi. Does anybody need anything? So we're kind of all on the same team to try and help each other out, which is so huge. I'm gathering that you you have a substantial skill set in this. Like you you know how to do all this stuff. You've honed it. You've optimized your. I, I imagine you have specific equipment, like more so than what I would have in my kitchen, to cook for a large <laughs> number of people. In, yeah, in but we way. also cook simply. Uh, nice. We you know every fancy meals are nice, mm -hmm. but they you know can kill a budget. So mm -hmm. things like pasta, roasted chicken, you nice. know tacos lots of rice lots of you know potatoes lots of pot, um, butter noodles um yeah all, yeah all the easy things so i you know for people i we love a special meal and holidays are great but we don't go above and beyond these fancy recipes like we'll look at a recipe and we'll know right away well we don't have this we can't afford that so we do cook very simply but with a bunch of little kids as most moms and dads know they like simple they don't want their food touching. They, you know, their favorite <laughs> meal is spaghetti and meatballs. Like, I'm like, you can have anything you want for your birthday. You know, we're, we do a lot of hamburgers, lots of food on the grill. But what I'm gathering though, is that it sounds a lot of thought and attention goes into this and it may be second nature to you at this point, yeah. but some so, yeah. like, this is not how I go shopping with this kind of stuff, uh, with, with this level <laughs> the of thought, sophistication. The thought is yeah. simple, live simply, just try to, you know, one, you know, shop the outside of the store, the yeah. outside aisles, buy you know, single ingredients, generic. I feel sorry for people do, who don't have an Aldi or a Lidl. Se seasonal I mean, fruits and vegetables. They're not yeah. outrageous. I think we talk about that in the book too, is like my kids will be like, oh, mom, can you get me a mango? And I go to the grocery store and mangoes are 99 cents for one. And I come home with three bags of clementines because they were two seventy nine dollars a bag. Mm -hmm. But then the next week I go and the mangoes are, you know, five for a dollar. So I get tons. So everybody gets their own mango, you know? So it's, they learn that it's not that we can't have mangoes. We can't have, you know, blueberries. It's just, we have them when they're on sale. And even when they're at the store with me, they'll be like, Oh, can I buy that? I'm like, no, it's not on sale. And then we go down a couple more aisles and, you know, their favorite cereal or something else is, you know, buy one, get one free. And I'm like, no, but this is on sale. We can get this. So I don't think any of our kids feel like they're missing out so, especially so, the ones who are married now who are like wow mom this, they yeah, actually yeah. appreciate us so much more when they start having kids for, for the first 20 years here we're, we're kind of staying above water not assuming any debt and building wealth through some automatic vehicles and then right. 
after in the last nine years, we get really intentional and multiple things happen at once where your housing expense becomes effectively zero besides the taxes and insurance, the 600 a month you mentioned with that. Yeah. It sounds like you have a paid off van that transports the clan um, uh, here in a, uh, uh, a pretty efficient manner. The most you're saying it's not good gas mileage. It's extraordinary gas mileage for transporting 15 per, people per, 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 yeah, per person. It's very good gas mileage. And when we've always paid cash for, you know, bought used uh, vehicles, this current van we've had 12, 10 or 12 years, and it was a couple years old, so it wasn't cheap, but it wasn't expensive and we paid cash for it. So. And that it's helps. great. We're helping the environment because we carpool everywhere. So if I have an extra seat in my car, I'm going to pick up one of my neighborhood kids. And we're going to bring them all to the park or to the pool or the youth group or, you know, wherever it is to the beach for the day. We always are really good about, again, I think community is huge. So, you know, we, we laugh because we'll get in our neighborhood. We have a bunch of big families. And when we all get to, you know, the cross country or swimming and all of our cars pull up. We're like, no, 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 no. This is ridiculous. Tomorrow I'll take, you pick up, you know, so we maximize that. So we aren't driving a lot. Yeah. But like you said, like nine years ago, it was kind of like a perfect storm of the mortgage was paid off. My salary was increasing. Um, I got more interested. Um, you know, the fire movement was just kind of where I just started hearing about it. I'm not sure how. And I, yeah. Can you, can you walk us through that? How, how, what was your kind of turning point mentally with this? What, what, what triggered that? With um, the fire well, I paid, well, I guess it's when I, I always wanted to pay off the mortgage and that was kind of financial because it was a 6%, you know, a little bit over 6% mortgage, but it was, it was actually more um, kind of more of a peace of mind type thing um, for me um, to, to have it paid off. And then I'm like, well, now I got this money, you know, I'm, what was I, mid, mid forties or so at the time. I didn't want to, <laughs> Like, man, I'm gonna have to work till I'm 70. I mean, I'm looking at how much I have saved and this and that. I'm like, well, if I start, you know, cramming all this money and and then upping it each year, and then you know, you get online and you start seeing all these finding things, you know, different people, but um websites and stuff, you know, regarding fire. And so I just got and I'm like, well, you know, we I can't do it as fast as you know, you know, people with dual incomes and no kids, but you know, we can still, you know retire before I'm 70. So I just the mad scientist was really kind of kind of made it a game, I guess almost like how how much can I save and you know and just kept upping the the savings rate each year. I would just until I was maxing everything out. And, and what, 15 or 16 years ago, he sacrificed buying a mo motorcycle and let me fix up our kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> that was a big deal. Well I, well well, let, let's ask about that. So, so it's 2012. You're beginning to make this these changes. Everything's hitting at once. Um, and, and and Sam, you were surprised, I think, when the house is paid off, right? No idea. Were you guys on the same? Did you guys get on the same page in the journey to towards fire? Was there was that kind of did this did, did, did that journey kind of continue in in a lot of your hands, Rob? Yeah, it's probably more me. It's I all Rob. I mean. <laughs> But I mean, I, would, I think she just said, you know, she didn't understand all the terms and stuff, but she knew, she knew I was, um, that we weren't going to be, you know, I was like, just, just cause we had this extra money, the mortgage, you know, we're not going to start going to, you know, Ruth Chris every night for dinner and buying, you know, a Jaguar, but we're going to, you know, we're going to save and we're going to work towards, you know, securing our future and our retirement, you know, whatever that would be. At, at first I was thinking it would take, you know, maybe 20 years, you know, may I get my early to mid sixties and then, you know, the rate of, uh, you know, rate of savings just increased and then the bull market and just, you know, stuff, God bless compound interest. So I, uh, or compounding or however you want to phrase it. And it just, um, yeah, it made us, made it more doable and you could see a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Well, Obviously a big advantage. Oh, go ahead. No, okay. He just says he's good with money and I'm good at not spending money. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it sounds like, um, what, one of the biggest things is last 10 years has not seen much in the way of inflation, uh, in, in a large sense, except for in housing. And for you guys, that's been a non-issue because your mortgage has been paid off for this journey. So that's a, that's a big piece of the puzzle that you were able to pay off with, you know, yeah. the, 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 the 12 yeah, years the prior. Great. Yeah. And I, I, our older kids, you know, they, a couple of them, I bought houses and I'm not sure, you know, going forward, it's going to be tougher. Yeah. Our oldest, who's just turned 31, 
just bought her fourth house and she has three children. She rents out the other three. They buy, they bought fixer uppers and foreclosures. And, wow. Uh, they live fantastic. down the road from us. So they have three houses in our, uh, in our town and one about 10 minutes away at, uh, that they so these, right now these teachers are just getting a whole career full of, of kids from 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 your guys family with that <laughs> well, <laughs> but yeah, and, yeah not having the inflation has been nice so <laughs> and then and they and i mean i guess well the house the prices are up i mean at least that at least the mortgage rates are you know so low i don't know what i haven't checked lately three three percent give or take for a 30-year fixed the houses are going like crazy around here Mm-hmm. And they probably are in Colorado too, and other places. Yep. That, yeah, it's amazing what these houses sell for. If I'd sell mine, if I didn't, you know, have people to. No. I go live in a tent down by the river. But, you know. With six <laughs> other people. Yeah. No. Yeah, no, no, just by myself. I don't know what they would. Do. <laughs> well, let me let, let me ask you this: How what you so the the approach is very simple strategically from an investing standpoint. It sounds yeah. HSA, Roth, four hundred one k. And you just max them in that order, basically. Is that correct? Yeah. I, uh, the, the, my order um, is uh, 401k to the match, to get my match. Um, that's what I did first. Then I started um, maxing out our IRAs um, first after that. The Roth IRA. Better, the Roth IRAs. Yeah, we both have Roth because they have better um, investment options. And then we had the HSA I didn't have 10 years ago when we started. But now, um, probably like three or four years ago, I started maxing that out. So that 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 actually became my second most important thing because I, I like the tax benefits of that, and it has a brokerage option too. So, four hundred one k for the match, HSA. Then we max out our Roth IRAs, and then I went back and started um, upping the uh, contribution rate to the four hundred one k till I till I reached the max on that too. But that that was my order of preference. But and this is another language to you. <laughs> if she would read the book on the chapters I wrote. <laughs> I, I, I love it. Um, so, and, and then what, 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 where, how did you determine your investment allocation from an asset class perspective? Um, just researching. Um, I probably, I don't, I, I, I like doing it. So, and I, I also have relatives that have been in investment and banking and bounce ideas off them. I, I don't have it quite on autopilot. I have some fire people just, you know, pick two or three index funds and, you know, set it and leave it. Um, I get a little more involved. I have index funds, but I also have some individual stocks because I enjoy researching and doing that too. So it, it's oh, a mix of investments. I want to underline that. I have individual stocks because I enjoy researching them. If you do not enjoy <laughs> researching individual stocks, you don't. should not be <laughs> investing in them. My I, husband yeah. loves Tesla, has been involved with Tesla for nine or 10 years. Anybody listens to this show has heard me talk about Tesla all the time. He talks about Tesla all the time. I don't care. I don't want to do the research. If it was up to me, we would not be investing in Tesla because I don't want to do the research on it, but he loves it and it has paid off. He's also done some, you know, he's had a couple of stocks that were stinkers. So I should say that too. I think he invested in the the sands in Las Vegas or something like you have yeah. to do your research. He didn't do any research when he invested in the sands. He just threw money at it um, and it didn't work out. So, yeah. yeah. And, and I mentioned that in the book. I'm like, if you don't like doing this or do anything, just, you know, pick a couple index funds or talk to somebody and just leave it alone. And, and we're not, I'm not, you know, financial planner certified or anything. This is all, you know, basically, I mean, I worked at a bank, but that was not, not in the investment area. And, so I understand the numbers and stuff is more self-taught and it's, it's, it's a kind of a hobby. I enjoy it. So, but yeah, if you don't, I tell my older kids, if you don't, you know, just pick a couple index funds and look back in 10 years and see how you're doing. You, you have eight kids currently with, in, in that you're still at home, uh, at home, no, six, six at home, <laughs> six, six at, at home, home. Okay. Eight, eight out of the house. But, but you, you are saying, hey, I go through, I max out, I take the match in the 401k, then the HSA, then the Roth, then finish out the 401k with this. Is mm-hmm. there any money left over after that? And do you have a strategy for that? Or is, is that? I, I, um, there is a little bit left over. Um, I, I do have a um, regular brokerage account that has money in it that I invest in. Okay. So, and, um, anything excess goes into that. There's that's not, remarkable. 
there's not always there's not always a lot excess in that. <laughs> I go think into that, but I think that's okay that there's not always a lot of excess <laughs> to go into that when you're doing all these other things. I mean, I'm listening to people talk about how they make a hundred thousand dollars as a single person or as dual income, no kids, and they can't find any money to put into their 401k. And I'm like, I bet you could. Yeah. If we looked, I mean, I'm sure there's extenuating circumstances that people couldn't, like a uh, really chronic illness with really expensive. I know MS right. is really expensive, but I think that the majority of people who aren't on the path to financial independence or say, oh, I could never do that, just don't feel like making the sacrifices. And do you consider any of this a sacrifice? I, it doesn't feel like we're sacrificing. And I know it, um, well, I've worked from home for 12 years, but when I used to be in an office, some of the single guys who I knew made more than me, you know, once in a while they would complain about not having any money saved or something. And then they would look <laughs> over, then they would look over at me and kind of get quiet and I just roll my eyes at them. And um, as you know, I, I'm pulling up to work in a 10 year old Honda and they have a two year old BMW. And for the long weekend, they flew down the Bahamas with some friends for three days. I'm like, well, <laughs> We live different lifestyle. I mean, that's your choice. You know, that's fine. But yeah. It's one of the funniest stories is Rob's younger brother. He always teased us about, you know, having all these kids and you can only bring three at my house at a time. And but <gasps> every year we would give him He was mostly joking. He's mostly joking. <laughs> we would give him a picture of all the kids. And so one Christmas, I guess it was about nine or 10 of the kids in the Christmas picture and a bunch of his buddies walked in his, their, his office complaining about, you know, not having money in this. And, you know, you got to give me more time. And I, I'm having all these financial troubles and we got to, you know, got to go to the daycare center to pick up our kids. And this costs so much money. And he just turned the picture around. He's like, this is my brother. You know, he's got 10 kids and he makes half of what I make. So don't even start. <laughs> <laughs> so even though he wasn't the lifestyle he chose, he still could kind of laugh it off and it wasn't inspired by, you know, that we can't, you can do it. It's just a matter of adjusting things. And as we say, you know, we, we spend less in some areas so that we can live more in other areas. So, we, you know, we want to go on this vacation or we wanted to make this big trip for my son's wedding in Arizona. So, you know, we just cut back a little bit here so that we can spend more in other places. But yeah. again, it's never seems to be any huge suffering. No. What's, what's the uh, understanding with your kids for around college? Well, they, Ooh, um, good question. Good yeah. question. <laughs> That's actually how we went viral is the uh, Washington Post saw, wrote an article about how our kids graduate debt free. And that went viral about five years ago. So, yeah, so they, um, well, as we mentioned, they're homeschooled, so they're usually done by the time they're 16 or so with the homeschooling part, high school, can only teach them so much, um, you know, chemistry and algebra, calculus, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So they go to the, uh, we have a really good community college about 20 minutes down the road. So they go there um, for two years, um, first two years and take all their basics and they know, they usually have an idea of what major they're going to do. So they know that the classes they're taking will transfer. Then they go to, to a state school. And you so guys are one. paying for the community college? No, no. We're, we're mean. We're, we're mean parents. They pay for their um, their own school. Um, a lot of them, especially the older ones, would get financial aid um, because we weren't making as much and we had more dependents. But yeah, so they, they all work. They start, you know, they all have jobs. They work. Um, Two or three jobs in the summer to pay for it. And save their money. And then they pay for the community college. And they live at home because, you know, it's, it's save money. Um, and so they do that for two years and they transfer to a four year school for their last two years. Um, university, we're in Maryland, so University of Maryland or Towson or you know, one, one of the schools here and they go there for two years. Some of them have lived at home and commuted. Some have lived on campus or off campus. And um, so the, the first, what, four or five, you know, they, they all finished up without debt. Um, three of them have advanced degrees. Some of the ones like kids six, seven, eight, they've taken out um, some mortgage or not mortgage. <laughs> it feels like a mortgage probably um, taken out student loan for their last um, semester or two, um, you know, for, to pay for part of it, to make it ends meet. And then they work towards paying off the loans. And then fast. number eight and nine have had to do college during the pandemic and their normal 
full-time and part-time jobs haven't been happening. So who knows what's going to happen with them. But actually, it even goes back a little farther. I mean, we make them pay for their own phone, their own service, their own car, their own insurance. I mean, we're, we're horrible. We're so mean. And all of our kids, most of our kids have bought their own car before they're 16 because they've saved up money from babysitting or dog walk, dog walking or you know plant watering or newspaper routes when those used to be a thing yeah. Once they hit lots 15. of babysitting lots and lots of babysitting and mommy helpers you know shoveling snow mowing grass when the phone when i get lots of phone calls like hey is anybody at your house able to babysit saturday night a lot of the kids will kind of fight over who's going to get the job <laughs> no it's my Who- turn i love that house how, how many how many um bedrooms does your house have our, we have seven bedrooms. Can you? Okay. So there's a table. lot of sharing going on with those bedrooms. Yeah. Yeah. So we have um, currently, we, well, we, every, there's six kids here and they all have their own bedroom right now. That, <laughs> that's a first. They're all that's very a luxury. Excited. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And um, yeah, so we, we, it was a five bedroom foreclosure we bought. And during the first year, we added um, a two bedroom ad- addition on the top, kind of on the top. We have a large walk-in attic that we bumped out and added windows. And so it's now seven bedrooms. So they, um, yeah. But what she was, so for the college, um, yeah, they've all, um, not all graduated completely debt-free, but most have, and two got their master's degree um, um, with the help of the state a program where the state, if you agree to work for the state for two years, they would um, pay for their master's and it was an advanced master's degree um, program or, or accelerated, I should say, where it was 12 months straight instead of two year program. Where in Maryland are you located? Just I'm curious because I grew up in Maryland as well. Yeah, we're in Bowie, which is near Annapolis, between Annapolis and D.C. Nice. Yeah, we're, I grew up in Howard County, Maryland, so not too far. OK, away. Like, like Columbia area or. Yep. OK, yeah, we're probably 30 minutes from down down the highway from from Columbia. And that's where my, my last office when I used to commute before I, yeah, started. I'll plug it in. Um, wow. Yeah. So, so okay. So we, we've got call it, call it, what, what else should we be asking you that we, that we can't even picture because of the, 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 um, the world of raising so many kids? Maybe weddings. We, we've have, we have four kids, four of the kids are married. Um, two, two of the girls and two of the boys are married. So we've had to pay for two weddings. And we've also, my one son, um, we love the girl he's married, don't get me wrong, but he married somebody, you know, who lived 3,000 miles away. So we, we trucked the, uh, well, not trucked, flew the entire family to uh, Arizona about four years ago, I think, about four years ago for um, a, um, his wedding. At first, I was very excited that he got engaged because uh, I was like, oh, good, I don't have to pay, you know, he, he's a son, I don't have to pay for this wedding. And then it, it, it I'm a little slow, so it took me a few days <laughs> for it to click in that, wait, I have to get like 15 people to Arizona <laughs> somehow and house them and feed them and- Two cars. And rent. Yes, yeah, so we wound up flying instead of driving. Um, and yeah, so, you know, all, all the flights and rent, a rented, two, rented two large vehicles, rented a house for a week in a nice neighborhood. And- I got you yeah. A-list oh, for the next two years <laughs> on one yeah. flight, one round trip. Yeah, we, we had a blast, but it, it was nice because we were able to do this um, because we were, you know, financially stable. And, and it was a great, we didn't have like, to go on a huge trip. Jet. Yeah. Got to go to the Grand Canyon. The kids got to go on an airplane for the first time. You know, got to do all the things. We laughed because of my mother-in-law, who's also very frugal, she and I, the first, our first trip we took all the kids to was to Goodwill. And we went and we bought all everybody Arizona t-shirts, Grand Canyon hats, you know, the, the snow globes of the Grand Canyon and like keychains and ornaments, all the things. So instead of buying them full price at the Grand Canyon, we were getting them for a quarter and 50 cents. That's awesome. What, what, what is the, uh, how, how do you work the weddings? What's the, what's the, the strategy there? Again, just me. Well, for the girls, we set a budget <laughs> and they're actually frugal and not, they're not super, you know, Want some fancy or needy they're not high maintenance i don't know if that's that's another right <laughs> pro tip our kids are 
make amazing spouses because they're not like, oh, I want this fancy car. I want to go on a fancy vacation or I want a fancy ring or a fancy, you know, whatever. Our, the in-laws who are married to our kids are so grateful that our children are, <laughs> I mean, that's a huge gift now. I and mean, we never thought about that. You know, when we were first having all these kids and living so simply, it was survival, you know, living from paycheck to paycheck, you know, our goal was to keep the tiny humans alive. And now they're turned out to be these amazing adults and responsible and not spoiled. And we give our daughters about $5,000 and we're like, here, do whatever you want with it. You know, you can have a simple wedding and pocket the change, or you can have a fancy wedding and add your own money. And they, and did, they did everything themselves. They did a great I mean, job. Do all the wedding planning and friends. And yeah. And so we have on our website, which is fatsfam.com we have three extra chapters that wouldn't fit in our book and one's how we do weddings one's how we feed a family and one's how we do college and those actually are our favorite chapters but they use those to you know you download them for free you don't have to buy our book or anything <laughs> nice well we will definitely link to that on the show notes can you spell out that url real quick it's um f is in frank a t z is in zebra f a m fats fam.com. All right. Well, 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 and if you, so you can go check that out or we'll link to that in the show notes at biggerpockets.com yeah, slash money show sim- 203. Yeah. It's a very simple website. We're working on that. When Rob retires, everyone's like, oh, you should pay $3,000 for someone to do your website. <laughs> we're like, that, that's, <laughs> it goes against everything that we stand for. We don't have I, th- I think you should tell one of your kids to take a course at the community college on web design. Right. We actually have some teenagers who are like, I can help you on that. But nice. right now this all happens so fast. I mean, we just were asked last year to write this book two months before the pandemic hit, like who would have thought that the world was going to need a book on finances. So we're kind of starry eyed right now that it's already gone through its first printing. You know, we're getting all these great reviews on Amazon. We're like, this is beyond like our friends in our neighborhood buying this book. So it's really been exciting and wonderful podcasts and blogs like you guys are really helping us out. Hopefully our friends are being frugal and buying one copy and passing it around. (laughs) (laughs) I just love your story because it literally knocks down every single argument that I have ever heard about why somebody could not possibly get to financial independence. And what it boils down to is you choose not to make any changes to your life to make massive changes down the road. You can live fairly frugally and still spend on stuff. I'm excited that you guys go on vacations. That's awesome. I know big families that never go on vacation. Yeah, well, exactly. (laughs) But I know big families that don't go. I mean, I think people need to, it's really about a mindset change. Like people need to stop thinking that a vacation has to be a cruise to Disney World or something. You know, when we were growing up, a vacation was you all got in the station wagon with your mom packed brown bag lunches and you drove to a relative's house and you visited and you spent time with your family. You know, it's nice that we can do these, you know, special trips. It's nice that you can do all these other things. But even I I was just thinking uh, we have a daughter-in-law having a baby and she kind of laughs, like, we're like, give us a list of the things you need. And she's like, I don't actually need anything because, you know, <laughs> my da- older daughter's like, I have an extra crib. The other daughter's like, I have a, you know, a stroller, you know, she's getting a, a new car seat, but you know, she doesn't need any clothes or anything. I have bags and bags of stuff from the older grandchildren. So it's just changing your mindset. Like you don't need all these fancy things. So are the children-in-law called like, you know, four and a half? Is that how you refer to them? (laughs) (laughs) They're called my daughter-in-love and my son-in-love, especially now that they're giving us grandbabies. (laughs) Yes. Yes. You need more babies now. Yes. Yeah. The the, my youngest is working. Five. She likes to spend money on the grandbabies. Yes, I, she would never buy our kids new clothes, and she's buying the grandbabies new clothes. I, I found <laughs> this really nice thrift store and get like all these things for like twenty five cents. And I'm like, oh, but I have to pink, and you know. <laughs> so what's what's next for you? Like like you said, you're ninety nine percent finished. What what is finished to look like in the in the phi journey, and and what's gonna what's the next on the horizon? 
That's what we've actually been talking about that. I, I like to do something part time. I, I, I know I can keep busy because I have plenty of hobbies and kids and grandkids around. So, yeah, trying to figure out if I want to. I don't think I want a job job, but figure out, you know, some streams of income to subsidize what we have saved and, and also to keep saving. I don't want to stop, you know, I don't want to go. I don't know, cold turkey is not the right word, but go from, you know, shoving money in all the time every month and then just taking it back out. So, I, you know, I like to keep up. And we're going to practice this summer our yeah, I've always made budget. A, yeah, I made a retirement budget. So <laughs> we're going we're to try that out this summer. Uh, well, I track our spending anyways, but we're going to try it this summer and see um, if it changes our lifestyle and how it works out. Just a, a, a little retirement foreshadowing and he's an ultra runner so he'll just run 100 miles for fun so yeah. <laughs> he'll have plenty and, to do yeah I, yeah I keep myself busy running with nothing else and, and you also have a, a book coming out which will be potentially a, a, an income source yep. as well right? it just came out on amazon already through the first printing and what can you can you tell us a little bit about the book sure so it was just um it's a a Catholic guide to spending less than living more. And it's just our story about how our family has found ways to spend less in areas so that we can live more in other ways. So living more to us was me getting to stay home or living more to us was having another baby or adopting another, adopting a child or fostering another one. And then because of my husband now in our state in life, you know, because he's so good with spending and saving money, and so wise about what we do spend money on, we're able to, you know, um, support ministries that we really feel called towards that we weren't able to do before and, you know, sponsor a child in a different country and things like that. So it helps our kids realize that, you know, even though we're saving money and like the kids say, say, say to us now, you know, we have, we're, we're selling these books. Well, you know, why do we have to have, you know, this for dinner tonight? You know, can't, you just sold a book. Can't we get something <laughs> fancier? <laughs> like, again, it's not living any differently and it's teaching them so that they'll stay out of debt. And, and what's wonderful in our family is the older kids are such a huge example for the younger kids. So they know that, you know, this particular sister can bought her, bought a nice car, um, with money that she had saved. She, she didn't have to buy, you know, she didn't have to go into debt to get a nice car or she, you know, their other sister has a house or they can help out, you know, with other things because they're so wise with what they're spending. Yeah, the, the older kids wrote a section for the book. Um, it was gonna be an appendix of, we gave them topics and they wrote, but, but it, it, instead of an appendix, there's, um, it wound up getting interwoven. So some of the kids quotes and thoughts and how they handle money, um, the older eight that are, are woven into the um, story. And that seems to be everybody's favorite part. I also have an account on Instagram. So it's Sam JMJ. And there's a video of them all reading their part, which a lot of people just thought was great to kind of see the kid reading what they had to say. And then Rob's on Twitter. I'm on Facebook under Sam Fatzinger. So uh, if anyone has any questions for us, you know, or you can send us messages on our, our blog or our website. Well, we do have four questions for you. The, these are the, the same four <laughs> questions. We call them the famous four questions that we ask uh, every guest. How was that for a seg, Mindy, um, by the way? Uh, <laughs> way and, better than yesterday's not so smooth segue. <laughs> yeah. Mindy, do you want to take the first one? Yes. Rob and Sam, what is your favorite finance book? And you can each have your own finance book. That's fine. You have one? Hmm. Yeah, probably Tightwad Gazette because I was, you know, as a mom, you're always looking for cheaper ways to, you know. Do everything. To fix things in the house or to, you know, budget meals or learning you know i was reading that when i was a new mom so like learning what a good price is for for meat and for detergent and you know making making a lot of our own things and making do with what we already have i mean rob has fixed more things by watching youtube videos instead of calling you know 1-800 fix it guy to fix something and sometimes we still have to call those people but at least he gave it a good shot his, his for the first time and, uh... I said my favorite book 
probably a common one is a million millionaire next door. Probably get that a lot. But. Love that one. Yeah, that's a great. That's one of my favorites as well. Um, now your your... favorite's gonna be this one. Oh, oh well, I should have said my own book. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's right. I, I we, read we, it. We, we, yeah, the, the rule is you can't plug your own books. But... <laughs> yeah, well, he made fun of me because when, as soon as it came in, I just devoured it. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I've never read it from cover to cover. You know, when you're writing a book, you just kind of get piecemeal and then you have to read the the final print on a computer. And I'm like, no, so I was highlighting it. I'm like, wow, these people really know what they're talking about. This is great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, what was your guys' biggest money mistake? <laughs> Is there a money mistake? We would sound arrogant if we said we didn't make any because we always make money mistakes. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what a big one would be. And maybe a car purchase. Um, we may have bought a car that was a lemon, but that, <laughs> I mean, that, that you, buying used cars is kind of a, roll the dice sometimes anyway so and we got great deals on on our two houses what about the townhouse like yeah the townhouse we actually um the, the first house we bought in 89 um i don't know if it's a mistake the, i mean the market was flat and i think we sold it for 500 dollars less than we paid for it hmm. we probably didn't need to start off in a townhouse although it was great and we ended up staying there till we were pregnant with our fourth baby but being the youngest of nine, you know, a lot of my brothers and sisters started off, you know, renting an apartment or, you know, you know, living in a, a dump. <laughs> but that, I mean, I loved that neighborhood and I loved that house, but it was probably fancier than maybe we even needed. And fancy in no sense to what people get nowadays when they buy these mega mansions. Yeah. Yeah. Rob, I mean, you said... You said it might be arrogant to say that we didn't make a biggest money mistake. <laughs> I don't hear a big money mistake in your story. I hear very intentional, hey, I don't like debt. So in 1989, I'm not going to have any more debt except the mortgage, which Scott and I don't feel is actual debt. It's like forgivable debt. Um, yeah, because well, you need now, a place to live. Nowadays, yeah, the 3%, I mean, it's almost like free money, but <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. Yeah, um, back but, then at ten percent, it didn't feel that way. Our first mortgage, but yeah, nowadays, because yeah, the older kids will ask me, and some of their friends, you know, in their late twenties, early thirties, well, should I pay off my mortgage first or retirement? I'm like, well, it's almost free money. I mean, whatever you're comfortable with, but you know, I I've kind of revert. I mean, you know, back then I was paying down my mortgage more, and nowadays, you know, it, you know, it makes more sense to save for retirement. But I would say uh, the the only times I make bad money decisions or financial decisions is when I'm unorganized. I know that sounds funny, but I'm not really that organized and I, I love <laughs> stuff and I have, a, you know, I'm not, I'm kind of messy, but like when I'm not organized and, and, and it might be just like a $5 or $10 purchase, but you know, if I can't find that book that I'm looking for or the glue gun that I know is in here somewhere, but because of the, you know, kids dumped out the arts and crafts, is, is really like when I'm not organized and when I'm not tidy, that's when I have to go out and spend money on something I know we have in the house. Yeah, yeah if you can't find it. I probably have eight hammers I own, but the kids keep, <laughs> I'll find them in the woods. The kids are building tree houses. I can't find my hammer, I'll buy <laughs> another one. So. And I think that's what's kind of nice about our older kids is they're living this whole new minimalist, which is, you know, never even, I've never even heard of that when I was first married, but it's kind of a nice way to live because they're living very simply they don't have lots of stuff i i love that and i think that's very financially frugal and financially wise so again i know it sounds funny but like you know if, if the pantry's not clean i can't tell that i have pasta or right. and you i mean you don't have to make a big financial mistake to get in trouble you can make a lots of little this you know, death by a thousand paper cuts i mean if you make a whole bunch of little ones they add up so yeah, try, yeah. Try to minimize those. I own about 47 utility knives because I can never find them and yeah. I need one right away. So I got to go get it. And yep, yeah, that's, exactly. <laughs> that's the organization is key. What is your best piece of advice for people who are just starting out? So I kind of tell people to remember my name and it's Sam. So S is for just simplify. Live simple, live simply, you know, buy sales. A is for you know, asking for help again, like building that community. I don't know about where your listeners are from, but around here we have 
you know, free cycle and 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 ask 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 you sell and all these other things on Facebook Marketplace. So don't go out and buy, you know, those rollerblades for your kids that they're not going to wear next week. Don't go out and buy, you know, my kids are like the hobby of the week. And, you know, oh, I, I want to be a professional golfer. Can you buy me golf clubs? Or I want to be a professional lacrosse player. Uh, my kids are like that all the time. And so what we just get this network, like I'll call the neighbors down the street, like, can I borrow your skateboard or, or can, do you have any rollerblades? Or like, oh yes, please just take them out of my, take them out of my garage. Just, I've been trying to get rid of these for years. So working a network like that, whether it's free cycle or whatever, a, a lot of times I just put something on my Facebook page, like, hey, you know, my kid needs a new bike. And I get five people saying, oh, here, take this one, take that one. So just building that network. So that's why I say by ask for help, ask around. And then M is that minimalizing, making do, you know, make a plan, you know, make a meal plan, whatever it is, make a plan what that goal is. If it's if it's a fancy vacation, if it's a new car, if it's a new house, or you know, whatever it is that you want, make a plan towards that and start chipping away at your debt so that you can afford that. And uh, mine would be um, save something each month, even if you're in debt with credit cards or just put something away, even if it's a little bit. Like I said we had our first, got our first house in spring of 89. And from the very first payment, I paid extra because it was a 10% loan. And I, so I mean, some months it was only $10 that I could pay extra. And I was also putting a little bit in savings and it, you know, it might be $5 a paycheck. It might be 10 back then. And Automate it if you can, and just just if nothing else, it gets you in the habit of saving something. Um, I know that people say pay yourself first. You know, just automate it and put something away. Um, either pay down debt if you have it too, but just you know, having an emergency fund, some type of cushion, will give you peace of mind, and you won't have to go you know put something on the credit card when the timing belt goes in your car. Or... Not that that ever happens to us monthly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I mean, that that's 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 effectively your your been your strategy for the for the last twenty years with this. Yeah, save and pay off save the house some and, more. and then put it all towards the and then not inflate the lifestyle and then automate the the wealth building. Yeah, it, I mean, it's worked for us, so yeah, it can work. That automated that automated stuff out of your uh, your checking account, you know, out of your. Do we have a checking account? No. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Okay, I, quiz, I was going to quiz around what bank we bank with, but I don't know. <laughs> It's a good thing she's trusting. What What is your last? This is the last and most difficult question. What is your favorite joke to tell at parties? <laughs> Guess how many kids we have, <laughs> <laughs> or name the fat singers from the oldest to the youngest. <laughs> bonus, you get a bonus. <laughs> yeah, maybe we could put. Well, well, we'll add an additional one after the joke. Of can we get all the names? Yep. You want the kids' names? Yeah. yeah. Our oldest is Alexandria, and then she's married to Pascal, and they have Scarlett and Luca and Andres, and then we have Joshua is our son. He's married to Katie, and they have Ellie and JJ and Fulton, and then Caleb is married to Sarah, and they're expecting a baby in August, and then we have Lizzie, and she's married to Paul, and they have Adelaide, and there, <laughs> and then there is... Barbara. 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 She's the fifth. And she's single. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently and, a good catch. Uh, yes, really good catch. <laughs> and then Joseph, he's also single. And then there's Robert, uh, and he's taken. And Dominic and Mary and Cecilia and Eric and Colby and Ray is nine. And Bradley is going to be five in August. That's awesome. That's awesome. That didn't sound like 14. You say really fast at night when you're well, saying your birthday. That was all the grandkids too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, and, but and the in-laws, the, the, the love in laws. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't they're gonna they listen, they're gonna be like, Mom, I can't believe you forgot me. Yeah, Alex, if it's only 13, I'm oh well. <laughs> Alex, Josh, Caleb, Elizabeth, Barbara, Joseph, Robert, Dominic, Mary, Cecilia, Eric, Colby, Colby Ray, and Bradley. Did we forget Colby? Colby. <laughs> I think we whoopsies, forgot Colby. Whoopsies. Yeah. Uh -oh. Well, we just named him now. Forgotten. I think we did forget Colby. He is 11. 
Did I forget him? Oh, well. He's my sweetie. <laughs> he's the last one I delivered. So he's num he's number 12. He's our, our dozen. <laughs> wow. Thank you guys so much for coming on the show today and, and joining us and telling your story with this. And if you're interested, if you're listening and interested in learning more, check out a Catholic guide to spending less and living more um, from them. And we'll also link to all of the social media profiles and all of the social media profiles of the 20 some odd folks that you mentioned just now, just kidding on that part. Uh, we'll, we'll link to all of those different profiles in your website at the, on the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash money show two zero three. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay, Scott, that was Rob and Sam Fatzinger. They have 14 more kids than you do. What did you think of their story? I, I, like I said, I found in the, in the intro here, I thought it was a uh, really inspiring, really powerful, and and shows that the fundamentals work even in situations like theirs where <laughs> they've got a tremendous no amount of kids. It's just a fundamentals-based approach. Um, they're going to, they have, they had a really good strategy, um, that they developed and worked on over 20 years to lower housing, transportation, and food expenses. And then once, once, uh, 2012 hit and they became intentional about building wealth, they were able to then just leverage and parlay those fundamentals into an effective investing strategy that generated, it, it sounds like they're either millionaires or close to it at this point, um, and finishing out their journey. So I hear from people all the time, I couldn't possibly go uh, be financially independent because I have kids. Here's a story that proves that you can. I can't because I'm a stay-at-home mom. So is Sam. I can't because I live in a high cost of living area. So do they. I can't because I don't make a huge salary. Neither do they. Like every single argument is just blown away and it boils down to living simply. If well, you let's don't have. Let's point out though that, like, hey, they didn't achieve phi in five years, right? I, I would argue they really achieved phi in about twenty years. After you know, once they started put, once they put the house in the fifteen-year mortgage and began paying it down in twelve, that's when they really began journeying towards it. So there is some truth, like, no, oh, you, you know, with fourteen kids, you're not going to get to phi and one income. You know, that's that's a median income. Um, with that now, now it's more, but you know, around a median income with there, you're not going to, you're not going to achieve phi in three years. Um, but you can, you can do it in 10, um, with this, it seems like even with a lot of these, these challenges that they had. Yeah. And I mean, we, we should acknowledge that we did have a bull market and we absolutely mm -hmm. took advantage of that. They absolutely took advantage of that, but it does not change the fact that they have way more mouths to feed way more bodies to clothe way more everything to do and they're still pursuing financial independence and i just love everything that they are sharing and like i said it boils down to living simply when your expenses are low you can do a lot more with the money that's coming in the money that's coming in doesn't have to be so vast it's just i just really love their story and i hope that you listeners love it too should we get out of here scott let's do it from episode 203 of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, he is Scott Trench, and I am Indy Jensen saying, Have fun storming the castle. <laughs>